as well. So that's pretty much what the um, hour and a half looks like today. If this gets too cold, yeah, I don't know how to close it. Gentlemen, could you help us? Or acceptable. Um, accessible. <laughs> so you can check out the website for like cool activities and for handouts. This is the website um, of the free sessions that you can watch. So you can either go to the TESOL Live Learning Center and look at sometimes they have free presentations or you can watch the first few minutes of a presentation for free but then they ask you to buy it. <laughs> so um, how can we sort of circumvent this because they're not cheap. Each presentation is um, quite a bit of money. Um, we can go here to the home page. This one again is in Portland. The one from Dallas is on a different server. It looks different. But you can see here, this is the, the basic page. And here we have download convention handouts. So the question is, first though, how do we know what convention handouts we want to download? So we could go, um, this also shows you where it is on the page, download convention handouts. This is what the form looks like. In order to get the handouts, you have to know either the presenter's last name or the abstract ID number, or look for key words and, words and phrases. That's super complicated. So the best thing to do is to find the program book, which is easily accessible online. And then you can go through, you can see it's in a PDF format. So you can go through and you can locate, um, at the back they have a list of everything based on topic. So you can look for teacher training materials, you can look for listening, for speaking, for reading, for integrated skills, everything. Um, so once you have that, you go back here and you put their last name and or you can put a phrase or keyword because sometimes, you know, for example, my last name is Smith and there are always like 50 Smiths. <laughs> so <laughs> it would not be helpful to just have the last name. And then you just begin the search and it will come up with the handouts that they use. If the presenters gave handouts, they will be there and you can download them um, for free. So it's a good resource to know about. I'm not sure if you are already aware of it. And I thought I would just start that. <laughs> the other nice thing uh, about TESOL is that they've started putting all of their plenary sessions online. So for example, if we wanted to see the five megatrends shaping the future of TESOL. This is um, James Alatis plenary. So this is the, um, the person who sponsors the plenary and the actual person who gave the plenary is um, David Grattle. So you would click on his image, just you know, see, read more, and then you go there, and here it is live streaming. And so you can watch it online. Um, the only thing that <laughs> kind of is not so great about this is that you have to go through the, um, the president's speech and then all the awards. <laughs> and this takes like 15 minutes. And if you try to fast forward, it will go back to the beginning. <laughs> and then you have to watch it all again. <laughs> so the best thing to do is while you're washing the dishes or preparing dinner, start. <laughs> do everything you need to do, and when you come back, you will be ready for the plenary. <laughs> At least that's what I do. <laughs> so the only thing to know about this also is you have to have a good internet connection because it is streaming. So um, if your internet is slow, it, it will take a long time. So uh, yeah, that's one of the downsides. but. Um, TESOL in Dallas from not 2014 but 2013 had several of the plenaries online and they were excellent plenaries as well. So I recommend um, if you want to look, browse, etc., go there for that information. There was a lot on vocabulary this year. So that takes us to vocabulary. And um, when we look at A Course in Language Teaching by Penny Err, 
She has a wonderful section on vocabulary. By the way, we do have that book at the ETRC if you wanted more information. Um, and she says that oftentimes when we're teaching vocabulary, this is what we're teaching. Do you agree? <laughs> more or less, can anyone tell me about it? For example, um, collocation. Who can describe that for us? Yeah. Oh, uh, we, we usually use words uh, not individually but uh, in pairs, like uh, word combinations. Mm -hmm. And usually when they are free combinations, it's, uh, it's, it uh, doesn't sound natural for, uh, for native speakers. For example, in Russian we say silny, uh, silny. In English, silny is strong, but in English, silny uh, dosh will be hard rain. Oh, hey, 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 I know that you can. <laughs> it's too early. Hey, it's too early for me too. <laughs> what? Let's start. No, 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 no. I'm a trainer. There is no teacher. I mean, we're all teachers. Okay. Let's start with connotation because that's the easiest one, right? How are we teaching? This is the aspect of meaning, right? Connotation. How are we teaching connotation? Okay, how about this? I'm going to break you into groups. <laughs> and I would like each group to define how we teach aspects of meaning, denotation, connotation, and appropriateness. Okay? So that way, you're not just one person. You're like four to five people thinking about how to teach these. <laughs> All right, so group one. Context. Yeah, meanings from the context, but they're culturally bound, yeah. right? So what someone says that would be offensive in the U.S. may not be offensive here. Like saying Dioshka in the U.S., you would get punched out, right? Like, hey girl, <laughs> that's, not, that's not appropriate. That has a negative connotation because it's, it's like demeaning for the woman that you're talking to. But here... Sometimes I'm like, yay, so call me a Dioshka. <laughs> I'm so not a Dioshka, but that's awesome. <laughs> you know, so it's a totally different, like, connotation. And <laughs> It is socially based. Right? Yeah, it's social. Whether or not you can use the word in a specific situation, mm -hmm. if it fits. Um, socially based and if it fits in general, like in terms of form and stuff. Okay, great. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Four, 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> you did do it. Okay, so these are, these are some activities uh, for younger learners. So we're going to go through younger learners, and then we're going to go through um, university, but also could be used in secondary school some activities for that. So the first one we have, so you can still be in your group, um, work with a partner to write as many different meanings using synonyms for the word word as you can. Okay? This is also another form of word. Um, okay, so the students could then just put all of their different words for words in a notebook and, you know, in their vocabulary notebook or whatever, and have the word webs surrounding the different words. Okay, so that's one of the activities that I really enjoy using. Um, so what types of vocabulary could you teach using a word web? What do you think? How do you currently use it? Semantic vocabulary. Semantic vocabulary? Okay. Great. What else? Essential, yeah, okay. 
But combinations, for example, uh, there's a noun and adjectives which can adore with this noun. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Or yeah. the word is used in different surroundings and having the phrases. Mm -hmm. in the oh, nice. The core word and then phrases which it uh, is completed. Okay, great. That's great. Idioms. Idioms as well. Yes, similar to the phrases. Yeah, great. IT words. IT. Good. Or the word. What is inside, and uh, uh, which other words are related that explain this word? For example, in the middle is environment, and it has a huge bunch of different right, words. Right, right. Very good. So, what part of the lesson, now that we've explored some possibilities for how to use the word web, what part of the lesson would you actually have the students use the word web or create a word web in? Like in the beginning, in the middle, in the end, like after what? Introduction. Introduction of new vocabulary for uh, brainstorming what the students do know uh, so far this theme is the, talk of the subject of the lesson. Okay, so as a brainstorm, as sort of like a warm up to assess what they do and don't know, okay, what else? I heard many people say it depends. Recycling. Great. So I think it depends on actually you can use it at every stage of the lesson. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's why it's great, right? <laughs> okay, good. Um, and then we have a word is basically a unit of all language. Languages it can be either spoken or written, can be one sound or a group of sounds that have meaning, can be one letter or symbol or group of letters or symbols that have meaning, and can be composed of one or more syllables. The reason that I'm showing you this is because basically we were looking at word and then this is an example of a definition of words and um, based on the word web that you do, the next step could be potentially to have the definition. Um, and you'll see that it is quite a bit, the definition is extended. So the students are seeing a lot of information not just like a very simple definition of the word. At what level would this be appropriate to teach vocabulary where you have extended definitions rather than a very simple definition? Upper, intermediate, advanced. Upper, intermediate to advanced, right. And why would you want to have an extended definition? It's easier to use that in the spoken or written language. The professional the needs for to, to, to train the them. Not. Well, we know more about the words. We have specific professional needs that the words are um, used for. And also, <coughs> words, as someone was saying, between nouns and adjectives sometimes can change some meaning, mm -hmm. right? And so it's important to know all of the possible definitions so that the students have a better idea of when to use the word appropriately. Right? So oftentimes, the students will look in the dictionary, at least from my experience. They'll look in the dictionary, they'll see the first thing, um, the first definition, and they'll just use that definition. You're like, hmm, not for this context. <laughs> and then they're like, what do you mean? But they said it in the dictionary, and it's like, well, did you read the rest of the definition? <laughs> because there was probably another word that would have been a better fit. Right? So just training in terms of reading definitions is important as well. Someone wanted to add something? Our birthday girl? Yeah. When you're, when you're writing something, it is important to know uh, more definitions uh, to make the language more vivid. It is some sort of composition or something like that. Exactly. And that gets us to our next stage, right? For especially younger learners having five star words versus two star words. So going into the complication of language and how it can be more exciting when you have nicer word choice, especially for writing. We have two star words being big, large, or small, little. And then the five star words, gigantic, huge, astronomical, massive. And having students create lists, especially for academic writing like we talked about yesterday. <laughs> A lot of times, even with my native speakers, when teaching writing, I'll find that they use this thing, stuff, and they'll use it 
to refer back to things, that to refer back to things, and you're like, okay, but the way the sentence is written, that could mean two different elements. <laughs> Which one is it? You know, so having um, basic words that frequently occur, especially in academic writing, and then having the students go through as an activity and list out other ways to say the same words, um, I, I have found that to be helpful. But also you can see that for younger learners, this is, um, this is good as well. Not for academic writing. <laughs> okay, so um, what techniques do you use to teach vocabulary? What I'd like us to do is to think about that and to look at the advantages and disadvantages of those techniques. And we'll fill out a little form where we have the technique. For example, we had the word web. Advantages is they're visual, they're teaching synonyms, um, and some of the disadvantages is it takes class time. Mm -hmm. This is true. <laughs> so see, you have an easy disadvantage for all of the activities. <laughs> and then for what type of lesson is this te technique most effective? So we talked about that a little. Well, we talked about when in the lesson, either as an assessment in terms of what they know at the beginning or as an opportunity to recycle, right? So this is asking a slightly different question. Um, what type of lesson is the technique most effective? So one might say a vocabulary lesson or a post-reading lesson, mm -hmm. right? When they're reviewing the words that they learned within the reading itself. Pre-reading. It could be a pre-reading activity. Mm -hmm. So what I'd like for you to do is just with each other in groups, discuss some of the techniques that you have used We'll get to the game part soon, I promise. Anything we could add to this? I like the idea here that um, the students or the learners ha take ownership over the games and over the language being used in the game. And um, I think that that can be very empowering for students. So I like the idea also of the, the game discourse is a space where they are suggesting rules, where they're playing with the language, where it's not always like just right and wrong. There's a potential for them to um, try new things out within the language. Um, so we also have reinforced vocabulary, encourage students to think in English and relax. And they may already play the word games in their own language, so it would be easy for them to transfer into English. Anything you would add? In fact, it is always connected with emotions. And uh, mm. if, it o if it is only the brain activity, it is remembered, it is retained, not as well as if all other aspects are involved. Absolutely. So, yeah. so even competition, it is not only excitement which is a positive uh, side of this, but when you lose it is negative and it is even remembered better than the positive <laughs> one. Yeah, so yeah. the students learn from that. That's true because they'll be like, I'll never make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. I'm remembering that mm -hmm. word. <laughs> very nice, thanks. Anything I, I, else? I think that the game may be very close to real life because for students, the uh, game is real life. Mm -hmm. For adults, it's real life. I mean, for students, it's a game. They, okay. They play the role, they pretend that they are for example, they are hares, they are rabbits, or they are tigers, and it's a game. We pretend that we are somebody else, but... Yeah, we do, don't we? <laughs> we have many faces. <laughs> okay, so um, how we use games in the classroom typically looks like this. It could be a warm-up or icebreaker, could be to introduce a topic, could be practicing vocabulary or grammar or reviewing key concepts. Right? So there's many different ways. This is not even a comprehensive list of how many ways we can use it in the classroom, but I figured it was a good basis. <laughs> okay, so our first game is Scategories. Has anyone played Scategories before? So Scategories is quite fun. It looks a little bit like this. Um, and I actually, we will play two games of Scategories. Um, 
to start, the concept of the game is very similar to uh, the game that was mentioned earlier where the students have a letter and then they have to say a word that is starting with that letter, mm -hmm. right? So you start with a list of different categories and these categories can be as complicated or as uncomplicated as you would like them to be. Uh, so for example, if we were to create categories, you see on our board here, we have a room, room for a letter, and then we have space for categories. What category would you like to put for our first? Food. Food. Okay. <laughs> and then what would you like for our second? Clothes. Clothes. Weather. Animal. Weather. That'll be so Animal. hard. Animal. 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 But I'd like you to try weather. That's why I said it was going to be really hard. <laughs> but I'm interested to see what you can do with that. And then house. Yeah. House. house will be as a, Oh, so household items. Okay. I'll put household, and this could mean chores or items. Okay, now I need numbers. So who can give me numbers? I need five different numbers. Seven. Seven. Ooh, seven, thirteen, it cannot be like two hundred. Three. 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 Five and one more. One. One. Okay, so. Jeez. <laughs> okay, so the first thing we do is for this one, we have um, the letter G. So who can think of a name of a food with grapes? Grapes, okay. Next. Clothing. Gloves. 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 Animal. Gloves. 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 Garden. Yeah. Well, it's household, yeah? Yeah. Mm. Okay. Garden tools. <laughs> That's household. Okay. So basically, you would have a set period of time, and individually, you would have to fill out, according to the letter, the different words. Right? Like we just did. So. What I asked you for is obviously like coordinating mm -hmm. with the specific letters of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. Right? So 13 is what? M. 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 Okay, so I'm going to give you one minute and I want you to make a list of these in only one minute. Go. Using M. So obviously you're reviewing the different foods at the same time. And then the student that has one that is that nobody else has gets a point. Okay? And so then they win when they have the most points. So in order to modify it, does that make sense? Is there any questions? Are there any questions I should say? Okay. So let's talk about the modification. Um, we can use it to practice collocate, collocations or grammar points. So, for example, gerunds and infinitives. Um, they can create their own categories based on what you've done in class. Um, you have a time limit. I set you a time limit, right? Because you're teachers. <laughs> but for students, you may have a longer time limit or a shorter time limit depending on how quickly you want to get through and how um, advanced they are. Um, Okay, so we did this already, and allow students, you can sometimes, especially at the beginning levels, allow them to write more than one thing. 
in the category. And obviously the reason for that is it will be more stimulating for them if they're at potentially like a, a less advanced level to be able to have more so that it's possible that they can get more points. You know, because they may not be able to fill out all the categories, but if they're really good at colors, they would have several in the colors and they would get points for several colors. Okay, so I'm going to show you an example of um, a modification. And we're going to do just a, a die, like you know for gambling, like, and then you drop it. So you have six sides. And so you fold them into die, and then the students are able, um, they have a collection of die, and they throw them, and um, they, uh, they throw them, and then they have to make a story based on what they, they say. So, so use dice with pictures on all six sides. Roll as many dice as you want. Look at the pictures on the top of the dice that were rolled. Create a story that involves all pictures and be as imaginative as and as descriptive as possible. Um, in terms of modifications, they can you can have students bring in images. They can write them themselves. They can draw them or they can print them so that you don't have to do that all, you know, collecting all the pictures. So that could be a homework assignment. Instead of rolling the dice, you can have them choose the pictures from a different pile, but then it's just like any other picture activity. I like the concept of having them in on a, a die. Like, that's singular, right? Dice, plural. <laughs> so I like the idea that they're rolling it and getting new pictures. This is um, for kinesthetic students. Yeah, exactly. And they, I mean, it works for any, it would work for me. Yeah, I'm visually totally kinesthetic. <laughs> I'm a visual kinesthetic learner, so I'm like, yay, this is wonderful. Okay, um, and then the pictures, they can actually be thematic, right? They can be coming from whatever you're talking about within the context of the lesson. So it doesn't have to be random pictures that you find. It can be completely related. Um, and then obviously you have them use the, the target grammar structures and vocabulary in order to, here's a, a collection of different pictures that are nice. So take one and pass it back. Oh, by the way, to close out the last activity, I put blank forms. Everybody has some blank forms of this, the categories one. Thank you. So take one and pass it back. If you want these online, you can also, you have the last name of the person who created them. These were created by Eleanor Westfold. So you can go on the TESOL website that I showed you earlier and download these forms in a uh, soft copy. Right, so then you can print them yourself, so you don't need to worry about making the forms dirty. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right, sweet. So those are just an example of some of the um, the next activity, the story cube. And then um, you can also have them obviously focus on target uh, vocabulary or unit concepts in the curriculum could be characters in a short story that they have to describe or something about vocabulary from a news article or whatever it is you want them to do. And um, you can make it more challenging by having another time limit set. Um, I think that you were saying you have them clap, right? And then as soon as they clap, what happens next? Do they get no, a new card? No, they are to make them sound or when the word was, when the, the taboo word was said. So just uh, make it a little bit more exciting because otherwise it becomes the same explanation and it's again boring. And then when there is a bell or clapping, they are a little bit awake and they get excited yeah, about it. Yeah, no, I love like it. this exercise only because we can clap. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Okay, so we're going to do an example, and we, I need one really brave volunteer. 
No? You've kind of already seen the word, but hopefully you don't remember what it is. Um, and what it would look like. So basically, we're all going to be a team, and there's going to be one person standing in the front guessing the word. I already know the word, otherwise I would do it myself, right? <laughs> but we want to have one example of what this would look like and what it would feel like. So who can be brave? <laughs> who can be brave? <laughs> and who doesn't know the word? Okay, yay! Olga, stand a little forward, otherwise you're going to be okay. Yeah, I don't want you to be blind. Okay, so Olga is going to have to guess. She's going to look at you. Uh -huh. And you're going to have to not say any of these words. She has to guess this word, right? So you have to describe this word so that she can guess it. You have to use synonyms of these words. Is this creature that is in the jungle? Right, it's huge. Huge size. Huge. 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 I know it's giraffe. With oh, two yeah. very large ears. Oh, very very small. Small. Hey, two who is giving the answer? Yeah. Yeah. She said elephant. Yes. This, okay. This, okay. This, okay. This animal is uh, neither black nor white. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something between. Any the other color? Is it a elephant? cards in one minute as yeah. you can. Yeah. And so you you want it to be easier because also if it's too hard the student will get super frustrated, right? If you're but the other thing is they also have to guess these words as well. So once you get the elephant, you would say it's um, another word for huge. And then they would have to go through and guess these words as well in order to get the full card. And then once this is complete, they turn it over and they pick another card. But you have to have one student monitoring. This is good to do also in pairs. You have to have one student monitoring to make sure none of these words are said. Right? So if they said jungle, I, I had to look to make sure you all didn't say animal. Creature. <laughs> yeah, creature. Yes. Um, so it takes, it's actually like three people in a team. So it could be one team like this. And um, those two are going at it, right? Like she, maybe she is um, giving the words, the, the clues, and she's guessing, okay? And then she has, they have one minute to complete this. And then in the next minute, you switch roles. So she's now monitoring to make sure that when um, she's reading everything, and I'm guessing she's not reading anything on the card. So you go around and then you, uh, as a group, you then compete to see which group, out of all three of the students, which group got the most cards. So they got the most points. Does that make sense? So this is one variation. No, it doesn't make sense? So basically, what you would do is, for example, if you have all of these, they're all cut out and they're face down on the, the desk, right? And so let's say that we're going through and I have this list and I say, okay, um, it's a thing that you give to um, an official if you want something to be done. A bribe. A bribe. <laughs> <laughs> the rules, these are the rules. You can also, I think, find the rules on like Wikipedia, probably. Or you can Google it. So this does take a lot of time. But the skills learned are so valuable. To me, I feel like it's worth the time because they're, they're learning skills that they can take to Canada if they go on like work and study or whatever. <laughs> work and travel. 
Okay, so that's how to play. Um, and here are some other word games for the classroom. We're actually, I had wanted to uh, stop and have you maybe write some of the word games that you use, but I don't think we'll have time because we have only five minutes left. But uh, Scrabble, I oftentimes use, and I actually, we just got some Scrabble games for our writing center at Kiev Mogila. Um, Scra Does everyone know Scrabble? Okay, fabulous. And Jeopardy. So Jeopardy doesn't even have to be about vocabulary, but it can be. For um, beginning learners, I will have, because Jeopardy sort of looks a little bit like this, where you have categories, mm -hmm. and then you have um, points, points. numerical values mm -hmm. associated with the, um, the difficulty of the vocabulary. So this would be, say, one, two, three, four. I think there's only four. It could be five. And then this one, if it's a food, this one may be a picture of an apple. This one may be a picture of grapes. This one may be a picture of what something? Caviar. What was it? Caviar. Oh, man, make it hard to draw. Jeez, caviar. Okay, this one may be a picture of an egg. Okay, that would be maybe up there. <laughs> but okay, we'll say we'll say an egg. This could be a poached egg, because that'll be hard. Eggplant. But it doesn't quite look like that. Oh yeah, eggplant. There we go. That's nice. Okay, and then five. The hardest. Sushi. Sushi. Oh, but it's a little easy, isn't it? No, it's not. I think it's easy because you have like sushi ya, the restaurant, and it's very popular. So I think sushi may be too easy. Okay. But that was a good guess. Uh, let's think. How about um, asparagus? Nice. I don't even know how to draw asparagus, but that's okay. Okay, asparagus. So then for clothing, it would be the same. And then the students are in groups. So this would be team one, team two, team three, team four, team five, whatever. And so the students, first you have a draw. And whichever team gets the draw, they have what we call control of the board, meaning that they get to choose the category and they get to choose the number. And so if we said that this was team one and they got control of the board first, I would ask them, okay, so which category you, would you like and what number value? And then you would say, there's all these categories. Clothes and number three. Clothes, three. And so I click on this. It's a PowerPoint you can download. I click on this and then an image will appear. <laughs> like, Kurt. Uh, let me do, um, ooh, no. Oh, this is gonna look horrible. But that's okay, you'll get the idea. Glove. Yeah, but what kind of glove? No. Look at how long it is. Um, so, hey! <laughs> um, okay, so, no, not for toes, that's a good guess. They're an opera glove, opera gloves, come up to here. So, yeah, because it's a three. Um, anyway, so then, Whoever can recognize it first has to raise their hand, and I choose the group whose hand comes up first. Then they have an opportunity to guess, and they, when you guess, you have to say, what is or who is? And that's the form they have to use. So you can use this with beginning learners, because all they have to do is say, what is Oh, what are grapes? <laughs> I was like, hmm, that doesn't really work. What is an apple, right? So they're practicing is and are. What are opera gloves? And if you got it correct, then I would say you still have control of the board. Choose again. If they have it incorrect, I will say, okay, everybody hands down. So who can guess again? Go. And then whoever's hand goes up first, then they'd guess. 
and if they are correct, then they have control. If they are not correct, I go through until every group has guessed. If there's no correct answer, I then give the correct answer. Does that make sense? So it's quite fun. I use it also for content. Not just vocabulary, but for content, because it's a great way to review right before an exam. I used it a lot at the University of Macau right before exams. Um, whenever there were specific things that they had to focus on, like different elements of a paragraph or uh, structures of this or that, whatever it was. Okay, so those are that's Jeopardy. And I think that's time. <laughs> Any questions, comments, or concerns? Here are the references. Oh, I am missing one reference. I apologize. It, the last reference that is not there is Penny Earth. I'm going to use your last one. I don't remember the date.